We have had a series of videos on the fabrication and sizing of standard steel trusses. We're going to continue on with that discussion, focusing now on the economics of span. Uh, this is a really crucial issue for architects. Ideally, in most building types, we'd like to have as much flexibility as possible to rearrange the interiors of the building without structural elements interfering with that process, which means that generally speaking, we would like to have fairly long spans. The downside of that is that the further you span, the more structural material is required and the higher the cost of the building structure. In addition to that, though, the further you span, the, deep, the deeper the structure, and that inevitably means the taller the building. Adding to the height of the building means that there is more building envelope that you have to pay for. There's more conductive gains and losses through the building envelope. Uh, there are greater wind loads on the building, greater overturning moments, and all of those things impact all the steel structure and also the footings. So in the end, you have these trade-offs of architectural convenience, of maximum interior flexibility versus the cost of the structure. One really wonderful example of how long span can help you is the Sears Tower, or it's now known as the Willis Tower. The free span in the Willis Tower is 75 feet in both directions. And the designers from Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill have indicated that that is one of the reasons that that real estate commands such high rental rates is because it's very easy to adapt the space to each new client and every time a client wants to make uh, renovations those renovations are easily facilitated by the fact that there is very little interference by the structure so as architects you would like to get a handle on what are the costs of longer span so that you can understand the implications. So that's what we're going to focus on. We're going to size standard steel trusses and we're going to focus on floors because floors tend to be more heavily loaded and if there are major cost implications from spanning a long distance, the floor will be the best indicator of that. And we're going to look at the effect of span on the amount of material in the trusses and the height of each story in the building. Now, in our previous example, we took a 30 by 30 column grid, but to give us a range of spans, we're now going to do 20 by 20, 30 by, excuse me, 40 by 40, and 60 by 60 for our column spacing. And then we're gonna look at some mixed spacings to see if we can get the benefits of long span without so much of the cost. So we're gonna start off with a 20, by 20 foot column grid and this is the spreadsheet and I just remind you the upper part of the spreadsheet has to do with sizing the joist and the lower part has to do with sizing the girders and you can't really see that image here so we're going to blow up the upper half of this and focus on joist first so that's what this looks like the joist is 20 feet the girder is 20 feet again for simplicity we're just taking the same five foot joist spacing, the same dead load of 53, and the same live load of 100 pounds per square foot. So when we multiply five times 53, we get 265. When we multiply five times 100, we get 500 for the live load. And again, we have the W dead and W live in this sequence with 1.2 W dead plus 1.6 W live in between. And that's because this is the arrangement of data that we want to have to help us go read the tables and avoid getting confused. And in addition to that, we have, we have calculated big W total factored, which is little w total factored times the joist length, uh, because parts of the table have to do with what is just the total force on the joist. 
So we're going to go into the tables for LH trusses. And let me go back and we needed 1,118 1, and 500 for our two numbers. And it turns out that there are no LH joists for 20 feet in length where they're indicating the 20 feet in this set of numbers here. But instead, um, we can look, and by the way, if this says 21 to 24, that also works for 20. Um, we could go try and find K trusses, but we'd have to change the spacing. And rather than go through that rigmarole, I'm just gonna work out of the table here. So this says 23,250. So our 1,118 and our 500, we're not even in that part of the table. When we go to safe load in between, we no longer have to check the live load. We'll just take this number, which is governed by sheer failure, which in, in the end means failure of one of the web members or the welded connection for the web members. So I'm gonna go back and I'm looking for 22,360 and 23,250 works, and 23,700 works. This one weighs 14 pounds per foot. That one's 12 pounds per foot. So the member we're looking for, the truss we're looking for is an 18 LH04, which weighs 12 pounds per foot. So we go put that in, 18 LH04, it's 18 inches deep. It weighs 12 pounds per foot that automatically calculates that the weight of that joist per square foot of floor is 2.4 pounds. That's 12 divided by five. Now we can take this number right here and multiply it times 1.2, which is the um, load factor, and add that to that, and we end up with this. And then when we get that, we calculate a new total force factor, gravity force associated with that joist of 22,648. And when we go back to our table, we see we're at 23,250. So this joist still checks and we've taken care of our joist with this 12 pounds per foot. We might, by the way, all these tables are set up to represent fairly typical conditions and the tables don't go to every conceivable uh, size. So it's possible that the uh, steel joist people would fabricate an even lighter truss uh, of greater depth um, if we put in a specific request. But for right now, 12 pounds per foot is a very lightweight member, so we're not going to worry about any of that too much. Okay, so now we're going to go look at the bottom of this table. So this is the upper half of our spreadsheet. This is the lower half. And we've taken this number, by the way, 22,360. Ooh, there's a mistake there. Let me go correct that. I'm sorry, I thought there was a mistake there, but I was mistaken. All right, so we've got a total of 22,648 um, 22, pounds of factored force associated with this joist. We're going to take half of that as the weight per vertex on a perimeter girder, and all of it as the weight per vertex on an interior girder. And so that would be 22.65 kips. So we're going to put 22.65 kips here and half of that there. This is for the perimeter girder. This is for the interior girder. And when I go to the tables and interpolate, it turns out for 11.32, the two values that I have that bracket that are 10.5 and 12 a truss with a force of 10.5 per vertex weighs 20 pounds per linear foot. One with 12 kips per vertex weighs 22 pounds per foot. Uh, for this one, for the interior girder, it's 22.65 kips. And the two numbers that I can interpolate between in the, in the table are 24 and 21. 
So let me just jump down and we see that uh, for our 11 something or other kips, we have 10.5 and 12. And here I'm picking again a 16 inch depth because I'm trying to keep this structure fairly shallow. And the reason is actually when I get to these girders, if I'm talking about floors, there could be multiple floors and every additional depth of floor is a fairly large economic cost associated with external skin on the building, higher wind loads on the building, um, greater uh, heat, heat loss and gain through the building envelope. So for the moment, I'm going with the shallowest girder provided which in every case has been of fairly deep proportions. It's been uh, of, of proportions D equals L over 15. So if I go with that number, interpolating between 10.5 and 12, the two numbers are 20 and 22. And then it, for the uh, 23 something or other kips, I'm interpolating between 21 and 24, and the numbers are 38 and 42. So here I have 38 and 42 for interpolating between a truss with a force, a lower force of 21 and a truss of a higher force of 24. And when I interpolate in between, I get a truss with a self weight of 40.2 and here I get 21.1. So those numbers are copied down here. And again, I remind you that when we divide the length by the depth, we get 15, L over D is 15. So this is still a pretty efficient truss, even though it's the shallowest one they list. So when I run the numbers, here's the, the uh, weight per square foot for a perimeter girder, the weight per square foot per an interior girder. If I average those two, which is what I should do because Part of the floor is supported by perimeter girders and part of them by interior. And I might as well just average them because they're very close to each other. And that way I don't have to get into questions about, well, what fraction of the floor is supported by interior girders versus perimeter. I'm just averaging them and that's going to be pretty close to the right answer no matter what. So when I average them, I get 2.06 and then I'm going to go back and look up here and for this I got 2.4 that's the area distributed self weight of the joist so I average that I add that to this and I get 4.46 2.4 plus 2.06 is 4.46 so I have a total weight for the structural elements supporting this floor that means joist, perimeter girders, interior girders. I get 4.46 pounds per square foot. And the overall depth turns out is the depth of the girder plus the five inches of the end bearing assembly of the LH truss sitting on top of the girder. And I remind you that the LH truss was only 18 inches deep, whereas this 16 inches plus the 5 inches of end bearing assembly is more than that. So this is what governs the depth. So I have a depth of 21 inches and a poundage in pounds per square foot of 4.46. All right, so now I'm going to do a 40 by 40 spacing and I'm going to go through this fairly fast. This is the spreadsheet and I need a 32 LH11 which is 32 inches deep and weighs 24 pounds per linear foot and its area distributed load is 4.8. Now I want you to notice that's exactly twice what it was for the 20 foot joist. So that's an important piece of information and we'll come back and revisit that when we've got all the data and you'll see what the trends are at that point. But again, uh, that comes out of this table. It's a 28 LH10 weighing 23 pounds per linear foot. All right. Um, 
this is the rest of the LH table and it just shows that the next deeper truss is actually heavier. It's 24 pounds per linear foot. So um, the previous table is the answer we want. It's a 28 LH10 weighing 23 pounds per linear foot. This is interesting. Why did I do that? I took this number instead. Well, that's not even right, but it's close enough. Instead of 23, oh wait, let me just check a second. Oh, here's what I did that, why I did that. I'm sorry. I took this 45872, and when I went in the tables and checked this, it didn't work anymore when I accounted for the self-weight. So these should have been purple, and these should have been red. And the actual answer is a 32 LH11, which weighs 24 pounds per linear foot. And this then works for that. Okay, so this came out to 4.8. And now we're going to jump down to the lower part of the spreadsheet. And we're going to do the girders, keeping in mind that 45,872 is the total load. And half of that in, in kips is... 22.94. All right, so we got 22.94 and 45.87. And again, we go into the girder table and we choose the lightest member. So that turns out to be for 40 foot span, for a five foot spacing, we're looking at the 32 inch deep. We interpolate between 70 and 83 for 21 and 24 kips and 152 and 75, 175 as the pounds per foot for the truss when we have a force of 45 kips and 52.5 kips per each vertex. So that's where these numbers came from. 45 and 52.5, 152 and 175. We interpolate and we get that the perimeter girder will weigh 78.4 pounds per foot and the interior girder 154.7 pounds per foot. And that information gets transferred down here. And that allows us to calculate the pounds per square foot of perimeter girder and the pounds per square foot of interior girder. Again, they're very close to each other, so we just average them. And then we add this number to the Joyce number of 4.8. So we have 4.8 for the joists and 8.69 for the girders and we add them together. Oh, excuse me, 3.89 for the girders. We add them together and we have a weight of 8.69 pounds per square foot of structural material. And the overall depth again is the 32 inches of the girder plus the five inches of the end bearing assembly. And the joist is less in depth than that. So now we go do the 60 by 60 foot by 60 foot. And again, this is what the um, top of our spreadsheet looks like. The joist is a 40 LH15, which is 40 inches deep and weighs 36 pounds per foot, which produces a weight in pounds per square foot of 7.2 pounds of joist per square foot of floor. And that comes from this table right here of 40 LH15 weighing 36 pounds per foot. And I'll leave it to you to verify that I did that correctly and I hope I did. And now we're going to uh, summarize all this information. When we go, excuse me, when we go design the girders, we end up with something weighing 148 pounds per foot for the perimeter girder, 291 pounds per foot for the interior girder. Those two things in pounds per square foot give these two numbers, which are very close. So again, we average them and we add this to the weight of the joist. And I want to go back real quick 
and point out because we're on a 60 foot span these joists are quite heavy there are 7.2 pounds per square foot of floor so when we add 7.2 to 4.9 we got 12.1 pounds per square foot the killer is when we look in the table let me go back in fact because this is worth noting when we go into the girder table you'll discover that when we get out to 60 and 75 kips parts of the table are just kind of disappearing at that point they're pretty much saying that if you're going to go these long spans we're going to force you to go to greater depth now they could have filled in all this table there's no technical reason why they couldn't but at some point the industry makes judgments about how extensive these tables are going to be and and whether certain examples are even practical or logical and so in this case we are forced to go down to a 60 inch depth for our interior girder which has these very large loads and so our perimeter girder might just as well be really deep also to take advantage of the economy of depth you'll notice instead of 191 we can get 163 and instead of 156 we can get 121 so since they're forcing us to go to 60 inches deep uh, for the heavily loaded one of the interior girder for the more lightly loaded perimeter girder we might as well do that also so we have a 60 inch deep girder and when we add the five inches of in bearing assembly we're 65 inches deep so here's a summary table that talks about all that if we're spanning 20 by 20 where our structural material is weighing 4.46 pounds per square foot that includes joist and girders and the overall depth is 21 inches we did the 30 by 30 example before and it was 6.57 pounds per square foot with a 29 inch depth the 40 by 40 weighed 8.69 pounds per square foot with a 37 inch depth and finally the 60 by 60 had a structural weight of 12.1 pounds per square foot and a depth of 65. so we're going to plot first of all depth versus span and that's what this looks like so this is the depth of the structure in inches not including the decking just the spanning material in the form of the trusses and this is the span in feet in this case we're dealing only with data where we have a column grid that has equal span in both directions so for 20 we have a depth of 21 for a span of 30 feet we have a depth of 29 for a span of 40 feet we have a depth of 37 and then we have this anomalous point and these three points by the way are almost exactly on a straight line that would have landed right here but because of the way the tables were organized for us we ended up having to take this point up here otherwise this would look a lot like a straight line and what that straight line tells us is if you span twice as far you spend roughly twice as much money on structural material here we're looking at the weight of structure in pounds per square foot and again we have like a straight line here for these three points and then this point would have been up here but it's down there and the reason it's down is they forced us to take a much deeper um, truss than we wanted to that made that that girder more structurally efficient which reduced the amount of weight in it which in turn improved the uh, or reduce the overall weight of the structure in terms of pounds per square foot so this sort of flick upwards was caused by the table and this became this flick downwards became a consequence of that in that the deeper truss is more structurally efficient the bottom line though is the cost and the depth of the structure go roughly in proportion to the span which is a very valuable concept now this linear variation is not absolutely perfect uh, it's working really well up to a 60 foot span if you go to 600 foot spans though 
eventually the weight of the spanning material becomes large enough and then things are non-linear in that the longer you make it the more weight it has and the more it burdens itself and so um, this uh, curve will take a, uh, both the curves depth and weight of structure will begin to curl upwards as you go to longer and longer spans but we're clearly nowhere near where that's a crucial issue yet so again we have a very linear relationship that the depth of the structure is in proportion to span and the weight of the structure is in proportion to span and by the way to first order this the last time i checked and of course you you these things are highly variable but this uh this kind of structural material cost about a dollar a pound installed so that's the way to that's paying for the structural element and the cost of assembling it into the building so right here we're talking about a little over 12 pounds uh which means about 12 dollars down here we're closer to four pounds or about four dollars okay now I guess I would like to make the point that this is starting to be very disturbing. If you have a structure that's 65 inches deep, um, you have a huge interstitial volume um, before you've added ducts and electric lighting. So if you're going to go with a structure this deep, you're probably going to try to run the, the, the ducts through the structure. But it would be nice for us to ask ourselves, can we, t can we get most of the advantages of span, but play this in some way uh, where we keep the depth down and, and the cost. So one of the things we'd like to have is we'd like to have a 60 foot span because uh, that accommodates double loaded parking underneath, but also a 60 foot span as we said, is really helpful to creating spaces that are easily reconfigured. Our big problem right here is this 65 inches was driven by the girders. So one of the things we can do is we can say, let's keep the span of the joist at 60 feet, but reduce the span of the girders to half as much. That will allow us to make the girders shallower or, or Yes, they'll be shallower because they're, they're only spanning half as far. And then we should be able to pretty radically cut this down. The second thing is a lot of the weight was in those girders. So if we can reduce the span of the girders, we should be able to bring the weight down also. So we're going to go through and we're going to look at a 60 foot by 30 foot column spacing. So this is what it looks like here in this direction. We have columns every 30 feet. In this direction, we have them every 60 feet. We've run the joist in the long direction. Now, some, sometimes we would rather run the girder in the long direction. For example, if we have a really high base space and we're not concerned about the depth of the structure, it's more economical to use one deep girder down the middle and then keep the joist uh, spans fairly short. But because we're driven at this moment by a desire to keep the height of our interstitial volume down. And we know that the joists are relatively shallow compared to the girders when they're spanning the same distance. We would like to reduce the span of the joist to get the depth of the joist more consistent with, reduce the span of the girders to get the depth of the girders more consistent with the depth of the joist. So here's our table. Here we've put joist 60 feet, girder equal 30. And by the way, all of this portion of this table looks exactly like the 60 by 60 span because in both cases, the, the joist is spanning 60 feet. The spacing of the joist is five feet. The loading on the floor is the same. All these numbers look the same. So we end up with a 40LH15 uh, for our joist, which is exactly what we got when we did the 60 by 60. And furthermore, this number, that number right there, and that number right there, 
This is the total factored gravity load on the joist. That did not change from the joist in the 60 by 60 span case. And the load on the perimeter girder and the load on the interior girder doesn't change. All that changes in this problem is the span of the girder. So when we go to, uh, and this by the way is just a repeat of the LH selection, which we basically said was like what we did before. So I'm going to go down to um, the bottom of this where we're selecting girders and we have loads similar to what we've seen before um, coming from the joists that are resting on the on the girder. The only thing that's different is now instead of uh, selecting a 60 foot long girder, we're selecting a 30 foot long girder. So we come into this table and here are our loads. 34.8, which interpolates between 30 and 37, and 69.67, which interpolates between 60 and 75. And so those interpolations, and by the way, this is left over from a previous problem. Um, so these are the interpolations that we're looking for. 30 to 37, which weighs 55 to 64. So we go back and we say, 55 to 64 for interpolating between a 30 kip force and a 37 kip force. And here we're interpolating between 60 and 75. And when we go to 60 to 75, we get 108 and 129. So that's this number and that. And when we did this, by the way, you'll notice what I did here. I went down to the deepest girder and the reason was, I already know that I have a 48 inch deep joist. So I'm thinking if I pick a 36 inch deep girder, and then I add five inches of end bearing assembly to that, I'll only be 41 inches deep overall, which is less than the 40, slightly more than the 40 inches of the joist so if I was absolutely trying to squeak out every inch, I could go with this 32. Or the other thing you could do is I'm sure you could ask for a 35 inch deep girder, but right now we're going to just work out of these tables. So I picked a 36 inch girder, which when we add the five inch in bearing assembly gives me an overall depth of the structural sandwich of 41 inches. And these are the numbers that I get from that. All right, so when I interpolate, I get 121, which comes down here. When I interpolate between this number and that, I get 62.7, which comes right here. And that gives me a weight per square foot for the perimeter girders of 2.09 and a weight per square foot or a poundage per square foot for the interior girders of 2.03. That averages out to 2.06 for girders in general, both perimeter and interior. And when I add that to the um, weight of the joist, I get 9.26 pounds per square foot for an overall depth of 41 inches. So now I'm gonna add this to my summary table. Here's the 20 by 20, the 40 by 40, the 60 by 60, and here's the 60 by 30. And you'll notice that uh, I've reduced the pounds per square foot from 12.1 to 9.26 by reducing this span, the span of the girder from 60 to 30. And we've reduced the overall depth of the structure from 65 to 41. So in other words, we're closer to a 40 by 40 grid, which was 8.69 and 37, than we are to the 60 by 60. So this 60 by 30 has given us lots of uh, free span, long span space that we can readily rearrange at a pretty reasonable weight of steel and a reasonable height for the structure. So that ends our discussion of um, economic implications of 
span. And by the way, I didn't convert all this to dollars because the cost uh, of things like, for example, this height uh, depends upon the cost of the building envelope, the overall height of the building, which affects the amount of wind load, which affects the wind bracing system and the foundations and things of that sort. So getting at the implications of all of that in economic terms will depend to a large degree on other details of your building design. So you may have a building where 41 inches is not problematical. Uh, on the other hand, if you're designing a 200 story building, um, you want to look at this interstitial volume really carefully. The key thing is you now have a sense of how much the depth of the structure tends to vary with the, with the span and how much the weight of steel tends to vary. But to make a point here in going from a 30 by 30, which was $6 and something per square foot to a 60 by 30, we've added roughly $3 a square foot um, to the cost of the building. And if the building is $200 a square foot to begin with, uh, we may be really happy that we spent that extra $3 a square foot to give ourselves this long span, which gives us so much more architectural flexibility. All right, so that ends our video on the economics of span as applied to standard steel trusses, where we have focused, as we said, mainly on floors because those are the most heavily loaded members and the most expensive members. And we have um, looked at the effect of span on the amount of material in the spanning trusses and the height of each story of the building.